Hey, welcome back to Conceptual Physics at Delaware Tech, Chapter 28, Reflection and Refraction. This is the second part of that video. So we just finished talking about refraction. We had already talked about reflection. We talked about versions of refraction and included dispersion. Now we're going to talk about something called total internal reflection. And this is a situation where instead of refracting out of the material going from one media to another, we have a reflection in the material uh, staying in the same media. So, so the definition here is that total internal reflection of light happens when light travels within a medium and strikes the boundary of another medium at an angle greater than or equal to some critical angle and reflects instead of refracting. All right, that sounds complicated. It's hard to follow. What does that really mean? All right, here's the... Here's the translation to that. Translation is if light is moving from a denser to a less denser medium, like water to air or glass to air, um, if the angle is too wide, in other words, too shallow, it's not steep enough, the light won't refract out of the material. It'll just instead reflect right back. So if you look at this diagram here, let's look at the uh, various flashlights that are underwater. We have flashlights labeled from one to seven. If we look at number one, the angle that the flashlight is pointing towards, towards the surface between the water and the air is a pretty steep angle. It's pretty close to the normal. So the angle of incidence of the, the flashlight's light to the normal is very small. It's a very small angle of incidence. And the angle of refraction, it, 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 it gets wider because it's going to air where, where air, it, the light can move faster. So you see it refracting out, of the, out into the air as you'd expect. And if you make number two, you have the angle a little bit wider. Uh, the angle of incidence is a little bit bigger. It refracts, and you see the angle of refraction into the air is still bigger than the angle of incidence from flashlight number two. And you keep doing this. You keep making it a shallower and shallower angle uh, in number three, and you get this refraction coming out where the angle of refraction is still wider than the angle of incidence from, from flashlight three. But then you get to four, and now it's refracting. And now it's where it's refracting is really starting to flatten out. Um, you get a lot of refraction. Again, the angle of refraction is still bigger than the angle of incidence. But look what happens when you get to, ang uh, to flashlight five. Now that angle of refraction has flattened out the light so much that it's essentially along the surface of the, of the water. Uh, the, the interface between the water and the air. And at that point, the light isn't really escaping out of the water. Instead, it just reflects back into the water. So it never really leaves the water. And by the time you're at six and seven, there's no light at all coming out of the water. It's just internally reflected. So all of the light uh, stays within the water. This is called total internal reflection. So remember the, the translation, if the light is too shallow an angle, instead of refracting out, because it can't refract out more than the angle that it's, it's refracting in, all right, that, that the incident ang uh, light is coming in, eventually, instead of going out of the, of the water into the air, in this case, it just is reflected back into the water. And that angle that, that where it changes from refraction out to reflection back in is called the critical angle. And every substance has its own critical angle. So for, for water, you have these reflections. It switches from refractions to reflections at this critical angle. I've circled it so you can see where it's measured uh, for the one that, that it's total reflection. For water going to air, that critical angle is 48 degrees. In other words, it's 48 degrees between that and the normal it will reflect back another 48 degrees with its angle of reflect, reflection. So you end up with this, this angle coming in at 48 and coming out at 48, and anything wider than 48 will still be reflected uh, back into the water. So this actually affects the vision of fish. Um, there's a minimum angle at which the beam of light can't uh, exit from the water into the air. So if a fish is looking up, if it looks straight up or at a pretty steep angle, the light will go, uh, the light from outside will actually reach him. So if he's looking up, 
the light that comes in a certain angle can reach him. But if he's looking at a more shallow angle, he's just going to see reflections within the water uh, because that light is totally reflected. So the light coming to him would be reflected back to him. So the only vision he can see outside of the water is light that's coming in very much above him and just just a little bit off from above him. So he gets to see a cone above him that's 96 degrees wide. In other words, 48 plus 48 degrees. Um, that's all he can see. It's a cone because it's three-dimensional. It's not a two-dimensional, just flat angle. And he can see this, this volume of space above him that's shaped like a cone. If he, if he looks outside of that, he's just seeing reflections back down to the bottom of the water, wherever the light's coming from that's reflecting uh, at the surface, at the interface between the two. Uh, so, so anything wider, he'll just see stuff in the water, not stuff up in the air. So the critical angle is different for every material. I already mentioned it's 48 degrees for, for water, for water going to air. For a diamond going to air, it's uh, about 24 degrees, much, much smaller. What that means is light has to be really close to perpendicular, only a li only 24.4 degrees off will get light coming back out of a diamond. Everything else gets stuck in the diamond reflecting around inside. Uh, and this is why diamonds are so sparkly because they are cut in a way with the right angle so that light coming say from the bottom of it will, will uh, come into it and then internally reflect uh, inside the diamond from one part of the di one side of the diamond to another and it'll bounce around and eventually come out and diamonds are the best cut diamonds they're called the round brilliant cuts these are cut in such a way so that they have the right side uh, the right angles sides the nice flat top and the right depth so that when light comes in from the top when people are showing off their nice rings light comes into the top will bounce around and then come back out the top in a different place. And all this different light will come out at different spots from the ring. And as a result, when you when you hold that ring and you look at it, you see all these sparkly colors because remember, it's also refracting and dispersing the different colors. So it's splitting up the, the reds from the, from the uh, uh, greens, from the blues and violets in there. So that by the time it comes out, you're seeing kind of a rainbow of different colors sparkling on the diamond. Now, older diamonds were cut either really shallow uh, so that when the light came in, uh, it refracted, but a lot of the light just went through the bottom. And then some of the older diamonds were cut very high so that when the light came in, it was re internally refracted, but went out the sides of the diamond. So nowadays, uh, cutting diamonds is not just an art, but it's real science to get the exact angles to get the best internal reflection so that so much of the light that comes down from the bottom will come back out the top in different places and have all the rainbows of colors split along the way by this internal reflection inside as well as the refraction coming out of the uh, going in the diamond and coming out of the diamond and this is where you get these beautiful colors and sparkles of of a diamond uh, you don't see this as much with other types of gemstones like emeralds rubies and sapphires. By the way, rubies and sapphires are exactly the same thing, except they have different trace metals uh, in, in them. Um, a ruby is just defined as a red sapphire, and uh, uh, sapphire is defined as any, any what we call carborundums, um, or corundums, excuse me, corundums that are not red. Uh, so a ruby is by definition only the red versions of sapphires. If they're not red, we call them sapphires. But sapphires and rubies, as well as a different stone, emeralds, they have much lower indexes of refraction than diamonds. So they don't have uh, uh, as much refraction and they don't have uh, uh, the critical angle that diamond does. So you don't get the sparkle with that. You get a little bit, but not anything like a diamond. All right, so internal reflection is actually used commercially uh, with prisms that are in optical devices, a, a uh, binoculars. And they serve multiple purposes. Because of the angles of the prisms that are used in there, they allow the light to be totally reflected inside the prism. So light enters the prism into a flat face, and, and uh, actually the, it'll enter the top one in this diagram, and be totally reflected inside, and then a total reflection, 
and then that will direct light into the second prism, which will have a total reflection, and then another total reflection out of that uh, prism to the eyepiece where you can see that light coming through. And this serves a couple purposes. One of them is to lengthen the path between the lenses. You have a lens near the eyepiece, and you have a lens uh, at the, uh, the, the wide end of the binoculars, and you want to have the proper focusing for them, so you need to have them a certain distance apart. And this, these, but these also uh, nicely direct the light in a different pathway, so you can. They don't have to be lined up in the same in the same orientation. So uh, these these total in, internal reflection glass prisms can be used to change the pathway of the light as well, uh, and that that can be very useful depending on the device you're using. Sometimes you might want it to make a right angle, and they can be used for that purpose as well. So reflection by two prisms will actually also invert the image. That's why two prisms are used, because otherwise when you look at something with binoculars that only went through one prism, everything would look upside down. So having that second prism re-inverts it. The first one inverts it, and then the second one inverts it again. And that's because real images that come out of anything are always inverted. Uh, so uh, the first prism will invert it, and the second prism will revert it, back to what looks normal to you. Totally different device that also uses internal reflection is uh, fiber optic cables, uh, also known as optical fibers. Uh, fiber optics for short, these are the so-called light pipes. Um, I remember going on a tour to Bell Labs years ago when I was a kid, seeing some of the, uh, some of the newest versions of, of these before they, before they were commercially available widely through the rest of the world, uh, and they were they were developing new types. In fact, Bell Labs invented a certain version of these. These have been around in some form or another for a long time, uh, but they invented a certain version that that uh, lowered the cost of transmission of light over long distances. Um, but these are flexible rods of glass or transparent plastic, so they're so thin they can actually bend, and you can use them to have light go through them. And because they're so tiny and light going through, even if the light isn't through a straight line, it'll hit the walls and the, the uh, critical angle of these is, is so small that any angle within that's bending inside the fiber optic cables is so shallow an angle that none of it will escape. And as a result, uh, light can go from one end of the fiber through long distances and totally be reflected against the sides on the inside of these cables. So you can have nearly the same brightness coming out at one end of the fiber of, of the optical fiber as you did that you pumped into the, to the starting side. And these are used in telecommunication all over the world now. I mean, uh, the United States is is in a great deal wired up with with uh, fiber optic cables for transmission of of uh, telephone signals, for instance. Uh, they're used in illuminating instrument uh, displays, so that if you want to uh, have a, a source of light somewhere in the instrument and the and where the light uh, button is uh, on that's on the external part of the of the box that you're looking at like a stereo there might be some line that runs curvy through the inside using optical fibers to to put out light in some part of the instrument um, dentists will use them in devices that that look in look in your mouth uh, that can be curved and and flexible so you have a flexible tube that the, the um, optical fibers running through. Uh, you pump light in from one end and you can put it in people's mouths and move it around and twist it. And uh, it's basically like a flexible flashlight. They can also be used for looking uh, at internal organs. People use this when you do colonoscopies or endoscopies when the tube is going down the front end. Um, you you uh, have a fiber optic uh, system so that these curved flexible tubes can go into people or, and, and people's body cavities and look around and you can shine light and they can have another cable accept the light so that uh, it can be read back on a TV monitor uh, in the doctor's office. Um, and I already mentioned telecommunications all across the country and probably all across the world by now. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about lenses. Uh, lenses are devices that will refract light based on, first of all, them changing the speed of light in there, that's because of the refractive index, but also because of the shape of the lens. Remember, light is, uh, light is refracted based on the normal 
that, that line that's perpendicular to the surface. But if you've got a curved lens, the normal is different every place along the surface. Because the surface is curving, the perpendiculars against that surface are also changing. And if you design the lens just right, you can make light coming that comes in in parallel lines to the lens all focus into a single point known as the focal point. Uh, so a converging lens will take light that's coming in from one direction on one side of the lens and bend it, depending on which part of the lens it's entering, will bend it in different amounts in different directions so that all of the light will end up cutting through a single point in space. It'll, it'll focus into one place. It'll crisscross and keep going, but there'll be one point where all the light is focused. And these are called this particular lens where, where the curve is like this. Uh, they're thicker in the middle and thinner on the, on the edges. That's called a converging lens, also known as a convex lens. We also have just the opposite, the diverging lens or divergent lens, also called the concave lens. This one's thinner in the center of the lens and wider at the edges. And this, this type of lens, if uh, parallel rays of light are coming through one side of the lens, the light is actually uh, divergent. It's, it's spreading out from the lens uh, after it's passed through by the refraction due to the shape of this lens. Uh, and then you can envision, envision this either in terms of rays, like in the top two diagrams, or in terms of waves in the bottom two diagrams. Uh, if, the, uh, if you look at uh, A, this is a converging lens, a convex lens, where you have parallel waves of, of light coming in, so say visible light coming in. And because of the shape of the lens, uh, we have some light waves that are uh, exiting the lens on the right side, the ones that are exiting uh, are moving faster on the edges where it hits the air first. So on the sides of the lens, the top and the bottom of the lens, light is coming out first. It's still being slowed down by the uh, when it's within the glass, so it ends up curving it uh, as it comes out of the glass, and this focuses it into a single point. And you get the exact opposite happening with the diverging lens though light waves uh, enter into the lens, and then because uh, you have the center of the waves leaving the lens earlier than the edges of the waves, they will move faster earlier than the, the edges will, so the waves end up being curved outward, and as a result, you get this uh, diverging pattern of the light waves as they exit the divergent lens. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of the, the basic terms when describing any kind of lens. We have the principal axis. The principal axis is essentially a, a horizontal line that goes through the center of the, of the lens and just extends in both directions. Uh, it'll, it'll connect the various points along the lens, including the center of curvature and the focal points. Um, the center of curvature, if you imagine the, this convex lens, uh, if you look at one side of the lens, you can think of it as part of a big circle. So if you ask yourself, where's the center of that big circle, that would be the center of curvature. And if you look at the left half of the lens, that's part of another big circle. And the, the center of that big circle would be the right center of curvature. And that's because lenses tend to be carved uh, as part of a circle on one side and part of a circle on another side. I will tell you that the best lenses are not spherical in nature. They're not this perfect circular curve. They're actually parabolic, so it's a slightly different curve, but it's much, much cheaper to make lenses that match a circle, uh, and, and small lenses work perfectly well. It's the edges that start uh, diverging away from the perfect parabola pattern, uh, and that's why the edges of, of lenses are not as good as the center of the lenses. But we're going we're gonna to treat this as if uh, a, a circular shape uh, works perfectly well. And then the focal length uh, refers to the distance between each of the two focal points, one on either side of the lens. These are the points that uh, if light came in in parallel rays on the left side of this lens, it would be focused into a point on the right side of the lens that's labeled the focal point. And if light came in from the right side of the lens in parallel rays, it would be focused on the left side of the lens at the left focal point. And you can see this in the diagram from the previous slide. You see the light coming in in the top diagram. It's focused to a point. That point is the focal point. 
So the length between the focal point and the center of the lens is just called the focal length. So there are two focal points, two focal lenses, I'm sorry, two fo focal points, two focal lengths, and two centers of curvature for this convex lens. Uh, so we already talked about the focal points, that's where the rays come together, and then the focal length is just that distance between the center and the focal point. All right, so a pinhole camera was really the first kind of camera ever created. And, and there's some discussion as to when the very first pinhole camera was ever produced. Um, people know for sure there were pinhole cameras as early as <clears throat> several, several hundred years uh, BCE. But there's now discussion that there was possibly uh, versions of pinhole cameras in tents or caves as early as 12,000 years ago. At, that is the Neolithic period, the, the Stone Age. Uh, so this is a very old construction by humans. And essentially what it is, is you have a, a box or a chamber or a room that's very dark inside with a single opening to light, a little pinhole. And that's what's shown here. You can make a pinhole camera yourself with a, with a shoe box or a bigger box, and you make a little hole that allows light to go through. And it's important to make it a little hole because any light that comes through has to travel in straight lines to get through that hole, and that will create an image on the inside surface of this box or chamber or room. And so people would actually make these things, and sometimes they would actually be entire rooms or large chamber rooms, um, and they would be kept relatively dark and a source of light on the outside, and the light would come through, and an image would be created that was, that was a real image because it was literally projected on the wall and real images are are always inverted unless they're inverted twice okay so this was the first first version of a camera there's no film to record the image so it's just projected on a wall and it was called the camera obscura and the camera obscura uh was is just the latin words that literally mean dark chamber or dark room Camera means chamber or room. Obscura means dark. So the word camera com comes from the fact that the first versions of a camera were just some kind of chamber, the camera, and it was kept dark in order to let a pinhole worth of light through there. So the images are real. They're projected on the wall, but they're always inverted. And the smaller the hole, the, 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 the less light that will get through. So you get a dimmer image. And that's the downside of a small hole. But the small hole also forces only light that, that, is in, that is focused in a very clean way through that hole. The smaller the hole, only certain rays of light will get through. So yes, it's dimmer, but you get a much sharper image, more clear image that's actually projected on the back wall. So it's kind of a balancing act to get a hole big enough to get some light through, but not too big that the image uh, starts starts getting blurry around the edges. So the sharper image is due to the tighter point of intersection of each of the waves of light coming through the uh, the hole. And you don't even need a box to make a pinhole camera. A tree will work perfectly well. Uh, and in fact, we saw this in in uh, the first chapter's lecture uh, about science, uh, unit uh, chapter one. And this is a picture of Lillian Hewitt, uh, uh, Paul Hewitt's wife, the, the author's wife. And she's standing under a tree and the, the little spaces between the leaves up in the tree just lets a little bit of sunlight get through. And, the, uh, and what you end up seeing are all these circular images on the ground. That's not because the holes between the leaves are circular in shape, they're all kinds of shapes. That's, those are images of the sun projected on the ground because the tiny spaces between the leaves only allow a certain amount of light through, and they come through, they intersect at that, the, in those spaces, and they end up forming these beautiful circular images on the ground, actual images of the sun. And we know that, among other things, because people have done this to look at solar eclipses where the, the sun is partially eclipsed by the moon, and you can, you can look under a tree in those cases, and you'll actually see images of the uh, partial eclipse on the ground. And that's, this is an image uh, taken uh, in, the, in the country of Malta. That's an island nation in the middle of the Mediterranean in 2005 when there was a partial solar eclipse there. So the moon 
was partially blocking the sun, so you ended up with these crescent sun shapes, um, and, and the light that came through the trees formed these crescent images, one after the other after the other, for each of the holes between the leaves up in the tree. So lenses, lenses bend straight line paths of light. So if you have, if you're looking at an image, you've got, uh, say, this flower, for instance, and you've got a convex lens, your typical magnifying glass that you would find in a, in a $1 store, and you held this up, the light coming from the flower, some of the light rays will go straight into the lens, and the ones that come straight into the lens will focus at the focal point, which would be where that blue line, uh, the top blue line intersects the black line, that's the principal axis line. And then some of the light will go right through the center of the lens, um, and that, that will uh, um, uh, eventually reach your eye as well. And your eye, because it's attached to your brain, perceives lines of light coming to it as if they must have come from a, an intersecting point somewhere, and we just, our brain imagines an image going back from the lines that really come from us, the solid blue lines, imagines these dotted blue lines, and so we see an image that's back behind the flower, uh, and this is, a, this is an image uh, that's, that's uh, an enlarged version of the real object, the real flower. So we end up seeing a larger flower back there. Uh, in this case, the flower is between the focal point and the central part of the lens, and the image is back more than more than one focal length away from the lens. So we see this enlarged uh, image, and this is this is how a typical magnifying glass works. So when you're holding the magnifying glass, you move it in such a way so that you you magnify it and and focus that that large image that appears back behind the actual object you're you're looking at. So a converging lens can actually project an image. Uh, on a wall, but that image will be inverted uh, when, you, when you do it. So if you had a candle here and you held it, you could actually project the image on the wall if, it was, if you held it at just the right distance. So here are a bunch of examples of converging lenses, and I'm giving you more detail than you need to know, but this is really if you want to see how they work. But you should know the, the basics, which is that a converging lens can project an inverted real image. So it's a real image, meaning if I stuck a piece of paper where the image is, it would actually be projected on the paper. I could see it. If I put photographic paper there, I could actually record it permanently. But it's a, it's a real image, but they're upside down. So it, this will work as long as the object is more than one focal length away from the lens. So I've marked the focal points with red dots for each of these four lenses. It's the same lens, the same focal lengths, with two focal points on here. And we're gonna put objects at different lengths from the, the actual converging lens. So in the first case, we're more than two focal lengths away. Uh, in the second case, in case B, we're somewhere between one and two focal lengths away. In case C, we're right at the focal point. And uh, so it's one focal length away. And at D, we're closer than one focal length. And let's see what will happen. <laughs> so if you look at image A, it's, I mean, sorry, object A, it's going to project light directly in the mirror, uh, in the, into the, the uh, lens, but it'll also project it in a, in a number of different directions. And we know that light that comes in uh, parallel to the primary axis, in other words, directly into the, uh, to the lens, will be focused at the focal point. So we know it'll go through that point. We also know that light that goes through the the closer focal point will do the exact opposite. It'll come to the lens and end up being parallel to the, to the uh, primary axis, uh, to the principal axis. So we know those two, two lines of light. We also know that whenever you shine light through any lens, if you shine it through the exact middle of the lens, it doesn't really diverge at all. There's no, ref no obvious refraction. And you'll notice all three of those points converge to one point. Well, that's where we're gonna see an image since we're following the light that came from the, the candle flame, that's where the candle flame where the, would be. And so I just drew in the rest of the, of the candle here. So it's a real image. In other words, I could put a piece of paper there and we'd see it projected on there. But it's smaller and it's, and it's inverted. Let's look at B. <laughs> B, we're, now we're closer than two focal lengths, but 
more than one focal length. So I have parallel lines will come through, uh, parallel rays of light will come in and focus the focal point. Anything coming through the first focal point, the near focal point, will hit the lens and go through parallel on the other side. And then we have a ray that goes right through the middle. Well, if I trace that, that's the flame. So the flame's image will be, in this case, bigger than the actual object and it'll still be inverted and it's still a real image. If I look at C, I put the, I put the object right at one focal length. And you might think, okay, well, that, that should be interesting. Well, I have a parallel line that goes into the lens and it hits the focal point, that's normal. But I can't have one that goes straight down into the focal point on the near side because it's sitting right on top of it. I can have one that goes right through the middle and you'll notice that that ends up being a line that's parallel to the one we already did. And then the only other one would be straight down through the focal point and that's kind of pointless. Well, you'll notice there's no point where these lines intersect. Even if I trace those lines backwards, there's no point where those, those uh, two main parallel lines come to a point. So there is no image in this case. We get no, no convergence of an image so we don't see anything when you put it right at the focal point. But what happens if you put the object closer than one focal length in, in, number, in D, in uh, uh, situation D? Well, now we have one that goes parallel, still goes through the focal point. We have one that goes right through the center of the lens and that doesn't, doesn't diverge. It, it just goes straight through without refraction. And that leaves the one that goes through the near focal point, which is actually behind it, but we can't, put light back that way, it's going in the wrong direction. We can put light into the lens that would have been in that direction had we, had we started at the near focal point. And we know that light that came from that direction would make parallel lines coming out of the lens. So we have three lines, they don't, they don't converge. So you might think, okay, there's no image. But remember, the human eye traces light back. If the eye was on the right side of this lens, it would see these rays of light that all seem to come from one place behind the lens. And in fact, that place would result in a virtual image that you'd be able to see if you were on the right side of the lens, but you wouldn't be able to put a piece of paper there. You wouldn't actually see that image. It's a, it's a virtual image that's upright and larger than the object. And then we have diverging lenses. and I'm not gonna go through all of this. This is more detail than we would ever expect from you, but in case you wanted to see how these work, a divergent lens can never project a real image. It's always in, in a virtual image and it's, up, it's an upright image. In other words, it's not upside down. So if we have A and B and C and D, the same situation of, of starting with an object far further than two focal lengths and then moving it between one and two for B, and then right at one focal length for C, and then less than one focal length for D. If you look at this, now the light diverges when it hits, hits the lens. And you end up with a very different pattern of light on these, these uh, lenses. So you have the second ray that would have approached the, out, the outer focal point. It, when it hits the lens, it just goes parallel to the primary axis, to the principal axis. And then you have one that goes right through the middle unimpeded. And you'll notice there's no intersection of these three rays. But again, if your eye is on the right side, it will assume that these three rays of light coming out from the lens, if they're looking through that lens uh, at the object, it'll see the light converge in a point behind the lens, but in front of the actual object. So that point that I just labeled here with the virtual upright image, and you would see a very small image. So the magnifying glasses, because this is a divergent lens, you actually see a small image, not a big one. And it's upright uh, because virtual images are actually upright. And you would see this tiny little image of your large candle in the background, but you'd see it closer and you'd see it smaller and it would be standing up. And if you, as you move the, the candle in closer, you get a very similar situation and, and you get the three uh, rays coming out, diverging as they come out of the lens. And if you trace them back, you see that intersecting point is right there and you still see a small image on the other side of the mirror. Remember the eyeballs over on the right. And then you put the lens right at the focal length. 
you get these rays coming out. And again, if you backtrack it, you still see an upright tiny image in front uh, between the object and the lens. And then finally, now you've got it right up against the lens, closer than one focal length. And you look at the different rays diverging out. And again, you find a tiny virtual upright image. So all four cases will result in varying sizes, but they're all smaller than the object of a virtual image that's upright and smaller than the object that you're looking at through this kind of uh, non-magnifying glass, a, a shrinking glass, what we call a divergent lens or a concave lens. So the action of lenses mainly depends on reflection, refraction, both or neither. Well, it's refraction. We're bending light as we come through the lenses, whether they're convex and convergent or concave and divergent. So lenses and air are made of two different materials. So the light has to pass from one media into another. And that's when we get refraction. That's the bending pattern. We already know that when light travels from one medium from, to another and frequently back. So the light's going into the glass and then it's coming out of the glass and into the air. And the reason why it's not always coming out at the same angle is because we have weird shapes for these lenses. They're curved in different ways on different sides. So we have defects in lenses, and these can either be in lenses that are man-made, or these could be the lenses in somebody's as in a human eye. So aberration is the technical term for a distortion of an image due to some issue with the lenses. Uh, and there are different types of aberrations. Uh, one is called the spherical aberration. Remember, you like to have a essentially the curvature of a circle on the left and the curvature of a circle on the right. And since these lenses are three dimensional, it's actually the curvature of a sphere on the left. It's a it's a little piece of a sphere that makes the shape of the left and a piece of a different sphere that makes the shape on the right. And if these things aren't close enough to a sphere, um, you'll you'll get uh, problems, especially at the edges, because remember, these really should be shaped not like a sphere, but like a three dimensional parabola. And what that means is a sphere is a good approximation of the curvature of a parabola, but it tends to be a, not as good a, a, a approximation near the edges of these uh, lenses. In other words, the top and the bottom of the lenses. And as a result, if you have light coming in at all the different places along the lens, uh, they don't all focus at the same focal point and you don't get a clear image. And this can happen with a human eye as well if the curvature of your lens is not the way that would focus light best inside your eye on the back of your in the back of your eye on your retina we also have something called the chromatic aberration and these are a lot harder to fix with the spherical aberration you could you could get uh glasses that will uh put new lenses in front of your eyes to fix the focusing of the light you could potentially get lasik surgery to change the shape of of your cornea to because remember the cornea and the lenses are doing the focusing and you could fix that but chr uh, chromatic aberration is the fact that different colors have different frequencies and different frequencies of light uh, refract differently remember high frequencies of light like blue and violet refract more than red frequencies of light well how can you possibly get rid of that well you can't with just a single lens there are high quality lenses that are a little bit better than low quality lenses but you're always going to get chromatic aberration unless you start pairing lenses together, like pairing a convergent lens with a divergent lens. So one will bend the, bend the high frequencies more than the other in one way, and the other will bend the high frequency light more uh, in the opposite way, and they'll kind of compensate for each other. So if you're making a device like a telescope or something, uh, you can, you can uh, use pairs of, of of opposite type lenses in order to get rid of these chromatic effects, but you can't really do it with a single lens. Now in astigmatism, uh, this, is, this is something that's common in people, and this is due to improper focusing either because the cornea isn't exactly the right curvature or the lens isn't the right curvature. And these are frequently repaired by either just having glasses that, that do have the right curvature to add to the curvature of your, of your natural lenses already, uh, and your natural cornea, so you're adding more glass to refract it just right 
so that it does end up focusing on your retina properly, or people will get LASIK surgery to change the shape of their cornea to make it the right curvature to get this beautiful focusing. And that is the end of this unit and the end of the course. And with that, I'd like to wish you all good luck. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure guiding you through conceptual physics. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, you should already have my contact information, but here it is again. And thank you very much.